Um, it basically means, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Um, we'd like to first um, express our gratitude and thanks to all of you who are present here. Today we basically are graced with a specific group of individuals uh, who would obviously share their experiences with us, and I'll uh, express it as we go on. Just on an aside, and you can see the projection as I have it here, we are presently aware of the, you obviously are aware of the ongoing genocide that is taking place in Gaza, the kind of shocking murder, the brutality that is affecting us, um, affecting the Palestinians on a daily basis, the constant incursions, um, and this is basically happening on a daily basis, despite the never-ending United Nations resolutions, despite the condemnations. Israel continues with impunity to commit these br brutal violations of human rights with the full support and backing of Western multinationals, uh, Western governments, the United States, Britain, France, and so on. And there is this consciousness that is in, uh, permeating the minds of certain individuals in the broader mass media. We also know, and I think the rabbi will amplify as he gets going, that even the current president, Obama, has made a certain position in respect of his stance. You look at the appointments that he has basically made. People like Rahm Emanuel, people like Dennis Ross, people like Hillary Clinton, people like Robert Gates, um, his primary mentors, Big New Brzezinski, all these pro-Israeli, pro-Zionist in terms of the ideology, and we need to question why. As you can see here, the borders of Israel detailing the so-called evolution of the state of Israel. And Golda Meir, one time prime minister, stated, the borders of Israel are determined by where Jews live, not where there is a line on a map. So the implications are quite drastic if you look at um, it pertaining, or certainly if you look at the development of Israel from what it was in 1948 right up till the present time. And these are some of the pictures, gruesome pictures. Here you have a pool of blood. Why is it that in our mass media, in the Mercury, in the Daily News, we see sanitized versions? We see a sanitized version of reality of what's basically happening. Look at the gruesome pictures. Babies. As if somehow or the other there is this kind of inclination towards sadistic pleasure to see little infants, babies being blown apart. And we hear nothing about it. You read the New York Times, or you look at the Associated Press, you look at Agency France Press, you look at Reuters, you look at the uh, London Times, you look at the Guardian, you look at the Washington Post, you look at the Los Angeles Times, a sanitized version of reality. This was captured on Al Jazeera. It's an ongoing, an ongoing, and some of the pictures are gruesome. They'll never show this. You won't see this in most of our n uh, national dailies. They're too gruesome. But you would see the other reality. You'd see an undue focus on other issues affecting us in the Muslim world, like the Mumbai bombings, or where, for example, there's been an indication that Muslims are behind a particular uh, uh, political uprising or a bomb blast, there'd be a tremendous amount of fo fo focus on that. So there's this moral duplicity in the mass media. And it's people like this that are behind it. These are the kind of individuals, the neoconservatives, people like John Bolton, Richard Pearl, Paul Wolfowitz, Dick Cheney, Ilyot Abraham, Zalmay Khalilzad, Louis Scooter Libby, and so on. These are the kind of individuals who are controlling the strings or the purses of power in the world today. Gandhi states, and I'll try and leave this with you, what difference does it make to the dead, the orphans and the homeless, whether the mad destruction is wrought under the name of totalitarianism or in the holy name of liberty and democracy? What difference does it make? Because at the end of the day, we see genocide, we see slaughter. They don't care about labels, be it totalitarianism or democracy, whatever you call these labels. But, as I said, despite the carnage, despite the ongoing slaughter, they, despite the anguish, this still arises hope. And hope lies in brave people like this, brave people like the gentleman I have here in front of me here. This was, I believe, a picture outside one of the buildings, if I'm not mistaken, in New York. Rabbi Weiss will, in fact, inform me on that. People who stand up, make a stand. And this is what the Quran asks for. It says, stand up for justice, even if it may, may be against your own next of kin. And that's what these brave Jewish gentlemen 
who are ultra-Orthodox Jews. They do not reject the tenets of Judaism. They are not an aberration. They go strictly by the letter of the law, and they emphasize and inform us that what is going on is against the primary tenets of Judaism. Uh, take great privilege to share the platform with him, Rabbi, uh, if I pronounce it correctly, and forgive me for mispronunciations, Yisroel David Weiss. Um, he was, in fact, a descendant of Hungarian Jews. He's, he's, um, his parents, in fact, were survivors of Auschwitz. I, I'm given to understand that his grandparents and his uncle and his immediate relatives were lost in the Second World War. Uh, his father, I'm told, apparently hid in a cellar during the Nazi occupation, during the rise of the Third Reich, and subsequently immigrated to the United States. So we've got someone who's a descendant of Holocaust survivors. The topic, as you had seen advertised, Israeli Zionism, is it set up for spiritual destruction? Um, and then, of course, thereafter, we would have an interactive question and answer session. We believe, and this is a policy of the IPCI, we don't have a talk-down approach. We always believe in engaging with the public. You are our equals. If there's anything that you wish to question, you wish to raise, there will be no taboos. You raise these issues with the rabbi, he would be more than willing to answer them, and we will therefore proceed. Uh, with God's help, with the help of the Almighty, I pray to the Almighty that he should bestow upon me his truth, his wisdom, uh, and that I should be worthy of conveying this truth to this esteemed gathering, uh, and that we should together be able to convey this to the world, God's truth, and uh, so be, we should be able to sanctify his name and bring uh, peace to the world as God's name is peace. And uh, this should be a beginning, I hope, uh, of, of uh, rectifying uh, the terrible, tragic happenings that we're seeing today. Uh, I mean, uh, assalamu alaikum to all of you. With God's help, the subject of uh, this uh, program, I was told, is, is Israel. Zionism, is it set up for spiritual destruction? And um, first, of course, I have to thank the IPCI for uh, uh, arranging this, for allowing this to take place. This is a great uh, privilege to be able to speak and take away the stain from Judaism, to take to, uh, to sanctify God's name. So it's, I'm uh, very, very thankful for this. And uh, of course, uh, my new friend that I met here, Yusuf Ismail, and, and Arif Islam for, for really, uh, making this happen. God should help. They should be able to uh, uh, attain what they're aspiring to do God's will. The subject matter is, of course, as we all understand, is a very, very intense, very complicated uh, subject. It, it, it is, a, uh, it is a, a subject that uh, we're dealing with for over a hundred years. If anybody, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware that Zionism is not 60 years uh, since the state, only it is uh, really, uh, well, it's uh, over a hundred years it's since the uh, people started going up from this movement to the, to the Holy Land, to Palestine, and the, con the concept the ideology behind all of this is uh, is another 30, 40 years. So basically, we're talking over 100 years, and um, uh, we have to. So, so it's not something which usually you can be able to really understand to totally, put in its proper perspective, um, take apart each of the uh, problems and all the facets of what. Uh, entails in in a, in a issue that is such a broad and such a long period of time as such a uh, an issue. But with God's help, uh, God can do anything, and God should put the words into my mouth. And the important thing is really just to open, uh, shed a light, to open a window, an opportunity that people should be able to go from here and further su study the subject. Uh, we never say to a person, of course, you know, accept my truth. What we're saying is that. We want you to see something that you should be able to go and search the truth and come to your own conclusions. With God's help, the, the, the question was, Israel, Zionism, is it set up for spiritual destruction? Uh, uh, that in and of itself is, uh, is, for the very religious Jewish community, is uh, showing, and, God, and forgive me, uh, Pete, I, I don't want to be insulting to anybody, but it shows already a lack 
of understanding of what has happened in the Jewish communities universally. Because uh, it's not set up as if it hasn't happened for a spiritual destruction. Um, the destruction since Zionism has come into fruition, it has, it has destroyed um, maybe today we're talking um, millions of millions of Jewish people. It has totally destroyed them. But there's always a, but, I may, but the truth is I am wrong, and the people from the IPCI is, is right because we always say there's always remaining in every human being and every person is that is that spark that they can repent, that they can change, that they can come back. So it's not destroyed. It's just. Uh, God forbid, maybe set up a spiritual destruction. God forbid, when we hope it will never happen. Um, let us get to the subject. Let, us, let me try to explain. We'll try to take it a little bit with God's help, step by step, that we should, one should comprehend the, the issue. Because sometimes if you just go and you start talking about problems, which is the, the, the world approach to the state of Israel, you have, um, the, and the Palestinians, and they're constantly putting Band-Aids and uh, patching and giving cortisone and medicine and uh, on, on the problem. And it's like you go to um, doctors, and God forbid it shouldn't happen to anybody, but I'm sure everybody's had this experience. They've had a problem, and they've gone to one doctor, and he gives the medication, and the guy goes home happy, he feels better, and the next day it may even get worse. He goes to another doctor, and he goes on from one to the next and to the next. And the, what is the problem? Why? What, they're giving very, very expensive, very good medicine. The pharmacist is very happy. The doctors, everybody's making money, and, uh, and so everybody's pretty much happy except the, the, uh, the patient is slowly but surely withering away. So the problem is because in order to give a remedy, one has to know what the sickness is. One has to, um, to understand the root cause of the problem. It's usually the body, uh, with, with one of God's miracles is that the body starts showing uh, responding to something that's a problematic. It's not that when you just put a, a band-aid on the problem, that's not way, the, the way to solve the problem. Uh, or you cut it off the limb, God forbid, or whatever it is, if, if you think you've reached the root, that's not the answer. Uh, in this case, you see that there has been <laughs> these great think tanks, there's, over the, there's 60 years of hawks and doves and all these very, very eloquent and uh, beautiful names for these all different think tanks around the world, people with PhDs and with you know doctorates and and around and and, and anybody who, who uh, comes along from a, a different uh, a different background. Let's just let's just say rabbis who don't, who don't have the secular aura of, uh, of of the education that they want or. The, so then they will they'll scoff at them and they'll minimize them and so forth, and um, and in the, for 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 those for that half a year for that year that they're implementing that new that new solution that they had it looks great and it seems perfect they've had the Oslo Accords it looked perfect and everybody was celebrating and it was the Six Day War and we can go through everything you know with when the 48th euphoric oh the Antebi well, miracles miraculous happy things this God this is terrific but and the, at the end of the day. It just came back and it got worse. So then, of course, they went back all the way to the Towers of Babel. They're building walls where they're almost holding by the Towers of Babel. And the width they're trying to, and they're not going, they're going to die. I mean, it's so laughing, but it's nothing. Of course, it's not a laughing matter. We're standing here, and, the, and as you see in these pictures that you can't really even look at, uh, while we're standing and trying, with God's help, to, to to help the people in Gaza, but the people in Gaza, I mean, there's no words, and if you speak about it, you, we will get choked up and cry because people are dying. People, people have, have over, uh, it was probably it's close to 400 people, we're talking now, I so it could be more already now, it was close to 400, are dead. People are dead uh, emotionally. Who knows how many tens and tens of thousands uh, of, from what happened, and affected and maimed and uh, we, we, what happens is the nature of human beings is that uh, we, after a few months, they'll, somehow they'll make some type of a peace, most probably some type of a band-aid they'll find, and we'll all forget about this, and, um, and we'll go on living our lives. And, but the, 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 the children, the parents, and everybody will be, will be living a, a living hell in, in, in Gaza and their relatives throughout and so forth. So this is uh, something that 
we have to understand, we have to talk, we have to do to, to, to find the root cause of all of what is happening. So with God's help, let me just try in a little patience, uh, let us try to understand. Uh, Judaism is uh, a religion. Judaism is basically, as anybody who's uh, studied the, knows that the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob made a bond, made a, a, a covenant with the Almighty on Mount Sinai to uphold uh, the, God's teachings, God's uh, truth, which is the Torah, and um, and they've uh, the concept is to be subservient totally to God's will, to be humbled to the Almighty, to aspire not for uh, for for praise and uh, for respect, but on the contrary, to be humbled that the, to to to, uh, to sort of minimize the materialism and bring up spirituality and uh, that godliness throughout the world. It's, this is what Judaism is. This is what we uh, basics of Judaism. Um, the, um, the Hillel, one of the great rabbis, a person came to him and said, "I want to convert to Judaism. I want to have the whole Torah on one foot. I want to hear the whole thing in once on one foot." So he said, um, "Okay, I'll tell you. Uh, it's not the son of What you hate done to you, I'll tell you. You shouldn't do to your neighbor. You shouldn't do to others. Um, basically, uh, another." Similar concept, it says in our Torah, it says, Mahu rachum rachum. Just as God is compassionate, you must be compassionate. Uh, we have to emulate God. God is the compassion, is the, and this is what it's all about. Uh, there is two parts of the Torah. There is the requirements that we have from, a, from us to God, things that not always we comprehend. Uh, there's the concept of the Sabbath, uh, many, many commandments that we do because God requires us, but between us and our maker. And then there's the other con part of the Torah that God requires of us that we have from one individual to another, to how to interact, how to be good, to um, do kindness all the time and so forth. This is what the Torah is, this is what we've accepted. This is Judaism, what we teach our children, and only this, and, and, and with our hearts, um, uh, 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 we worry and we are broken about if God forbid we find uh, hate or, uh, or, or, or misdeeds or inhumane actions in our children or something, this would, would break us entirely because this is not what we want. We want godliness. And this is what we teach and we've been promulgating and teaching throughout time. Basically, uh, this is Judaism that has been done, and it's, it's, it's forbidden to be changed. We're not allowed to change one iota from the, from the, the Torah that we've accepted. This uh, is spirituality. Basically, Judaism is spirituality of thousands of years. Zionism, Zionism is the transformation of this spirituality, of humbling to God, subservience to God, transforming this into base materialism a nationalistic goal, to have a piece of land, to be uh, praised, to be respected a nation amongst nations for your physical attributes, for your a strong Maccabee, kid, your Olympic team, for your strong military, and to be listed amongst the leading nations and so forth. It's totally uh, the uh, antithetical to what, Zion, to what Judaism is. Uh, look at the, and you just look at the ones who came along with this ideology and you will understand uh, this Zionism was created by people who had estranged themselves from God and the Torah, who detested godliness and religion. Theodore Herzl, Zev Jabotinsky, Ben-Gurion, these people were professed, wrote openly and proudly of their, uh, of their hate for anything godly. And... Uh, we, I'll just quote two or three little just uh, anecdotal statements of their own, of Zionists, so you should understand that, you know, again, that it's not just um, <laughs> what they would say, our hate mongering, because we, have, we just want to let you go study it for yourself, see what we're talking here. Um, so this is what the difference is. Judaism is religion, Zionism is materialism, nationalism. Created... Uh, it's a mere a hundred and odd years. It's an ideology that is relatively new. Judaism is thousands of years old. Uh, so basically you have, in short, the difference. Nationalism, it happens to be, besides that, that in and of itself 
is antithetical and, uh, and understandably opposed by anybody who, who, is, uh, who represents Judaism, who, who take, who's uh, fathers of communities who want the Jewish people to be God-fearing, they oppose that understandably. Uh, and looking at the people who are pushing this plan, of course you oppose them. Um, Theodor Herzl, for instance, wrote in his own diaries, it's there for everybody to see, in page 14 he writes, a way to solve the problem of anti-Semitism is to speak to the head priest of Vienna, to get an appointment with the Pope, to make a mass conversion of all the Jews of Austria to Catholicism. That is, again, a solution to solve the problem to make Jews simply drop the religion. He continues, it should be done on a Sunday, in the middle of the day, with music, pride, publicly. We are the last generation to, that held on to the faith of our forefathers. So he, there is somebody who is the father of a movement that's taking the representation of, uh, of, of the religion Judaism and, and using it till today they consider themselves the representation of Judaism. Um, and then just in case you think that he somehow he was drunk when he wrote that, but in a, the bi-weekly Tamura, which is on page 12, 13, he wrote, I didn't circumcise my son hands, and this will bring the redemption closer. I mean, he's, uh, the covenant, one of the basics of the covenants, we know, is the circumcision, and Jews gave their lives to be able to carry out that we just went through the holiday of lights with the reason, the whole concept of Maccabees, I don't know if time will allow, we'll get into that. The Jews were under the Greeks, and they accepted being under the Greeks. So the only time that they stood up and opposed it was when they were, there was a decree that they cannot observe the Sabbath or make, do circumcision punishable by death. Then they stood up, and who stood up? A few old rabbis, and they had a miraculous happening. Uh, so, and here he did, he had, nobody was stopping him except himself, and nobody will refute the fact, it's in their own writings, that he had a swan on, and till the day of his death he didn't circumcise him. The one, um, Zev Jabotinsky, uh, who was the far, one of the well-known leaders of Zionism, the uh, uh, promulgators of, uh, of this movement, and was the mentor of Menachem Begin, wrote in, in 1919, uh, Chadosh uh, newspaper, he wrote, in the national home that they're aspiring to have, we will announce that those Jews who have on themselves the rust of Golas, that means of exile, and deny to shave off their beards and pay us their side locks, will be second class citizens and will not have the right to vote. I mean, this sounds like a Nazi. It sounds like from Ku Klux Klan or somebody who has this Aryan view or something like that. In fact, there is a, a very famous rabbi in the in 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 Palestine, one of uh, who has many many followers, who uh, has a tape about this. And he and he, he usually, what he does is usually he starts a speech. He says, "I want to quote a few quotes. I want you to tell me who said these quotes." And so he says, "Hitler, you know, somebody, you know, this." Uh, and, and and he says, "No." No. And he goes through, he has a bunch of these, we have this m many, many such um, issues. And Ben-Gurion, just to round it off, um, um, Ben-Gurion, uh, who was the first prime minister, uh, said in, in, he said that if I could, when the Jews were being 